Hello everyone, in today's video, I'll show you how to create an inventory tracking dashboard. Let's quickly review what we'll be building today. The dashboard displays product names in the rows. The first column shows the closing stock value, followed by a forecast for the next three months. These months are dynamic, so if the closing stock is for the month of May, the forecast will be for June, July, and August, and so on. Based on the closing stock and the three-month forecast, the next column displays the stock cover indicating the months of stock we have on hand. Next, there's a column for the lead time. If the lead time plus a safety stock of four months exceeds the current stock cover, the dashboard triggers a reorder point and indicates the amount of a stock that we need to reorder in the reorder quantity column. Finally, it breaks down the closing stock into three buckets based on the expiry date of the products. If the forecast for the next three months isn't sufficient to consume the stock in any expiry bucket, the dashboard highlights it in red. We will also build a feature that allows the users to select different levels of data. For example, if someone wants to view this report at the category or the subcategory level rather than by product name, then they can easily do so by clicking the buttons at the top. Additionally, users can filter to see only the stock that is at a high risk of write-off or only the products for which the reorder point has been reached. Whether you're a supply chain professional, an inventory manager, or a finance manager, this dashboard could be very helpful for your work. In setting up this dashboard, you will learn a wide range of skills. We'll begin by reviewing the raw data required and setting up the appropriate data model. After that, we'll create measures using variables and DAX functions such as inscope, if, switch, sumx, and many more. Once the calculations are established, we'll explore how to use parameters to enable user interactivity. Along the way, I'll share numerous formatting tips, tricks, and conditional formatting techniques to ensure your reports look sharp and professional. I hope you're excited, so let's jump right in. Let's start off by reviewing the raw data. I have two input files for this dashboard. The first is the forecast file, which contains the forecast for all the products by month. The second file is the inventory report, which shows the stock on hand of all the products, their expiry date, and the date on which the stock report was extracted. Next, we have a mapping file. Inside the mapping file, we have two sheets. One is for the product master data and the other for the calendar. Now that we've seen the raw data, it's time to move into Power BI Desktop where the real action is going to happen. In this Power BI file, I have already loaded the four tables which we just saw. Let me quickly show you the Power Query Editor view so you can see the transformations I have done. This is our calendar table. As you can see, not a many transformations here. Next is our Product Master Data table and the Stock Report. Again, pretty basic transformations like promoting headers and changing the data type. Next, we have the forecast query. Here, I have done one transformation which I want to highlight. I have unpivoted the month or the date columns to bring them into the rows. I'm assuming the viewers of this video would have some knowledge of Power Query. Therefore, I will not go into the details behind the reasons and the logic for the transformations. If you want to brush up your Power Query skills, I will provide a link to some videos in the description. Next, we will navigate to the data model view, where we will set up the relationships. As you might have guessed, we have two mapping tables in this data model, which is the calendar and the product master data table. And we have two fact tables, which is the stock report and the forecast. We will connect both the fact tables to each of the mapping tables. The primary key in the product master data is the product ID and the primary key in the calendar table is the, is the date field. So now all our connections have been set up. We have one too many relationships between calendar and the two fact tables as well as the product master data and the two fact tables. Now one more thing we'll need to do is set up a measure table. So we'll go to the data view. And I'll enter the data and set up a measure table. 
This is the table where we will store all our measures. So here we go. All our basics are now set up and we can go ahead with setting up our dashboard. First of all, I'll give a green color to my uh, canvas background. It just makes it uh, pop out a little bit. Next, we will add a metrics table. And start doing the core work here. So first of all, I'll get the product name into the rows. And just looking at the final output that we want to achieve, the first column that we want to get to is the closing stock in quantities. So we'll go into our measure table and set up our first measure. So I'll call it stock quantity. And it's going to be a simple measure. It's going to be a sum of stock report quantity. Now that the measure has been set up, we will bring it into our metrics table by dragging it into the value section. Cool. So we have the measure working at it's in our dashboard now. Now let's do a bit of a formatting here. So I'll click on the measure. And then in the format, just to make the numbers look more accessible, we have converted the values in thousands. Next, we need to set up a measure for the next three months forecast in a dynamic way, such that if the closing stock in the first column is for the month of May, the forecast M plus one should show the forecast for the month of June and so on. So let's go ahead and start setting up that measure. So I'll name this measure forecast M plus one. So let's first decide which month's forecast do we need in the forecast M plus one measure. Looking at our stock report, we know that the closing stock is for the month of May. Therefore, forecast M plus one will be the forecast for the month of June. Now, what if we write this formula in forecast M plus one? That is, we sum the entire value column in the forecast table. The problem is that in the forecast table, there are many other months apart from June. And with this formula, we are gonna sum up the entire column rather than only the data for the month of June. Therefore, we need to tell Power BI to sum the value column only for those rows where the data is related for the month of June. This can be achieved by using the calculate function. Let's quickly decode the calculate formula here. Basically, in the first condition of this formula, we are asking Power BI to calculate the sum of the forecast. In the second condition, we are specifying that we need to do this only for those rows where the month number is six. So let's hit enter and bring the measure into our metrics table. I will format this measure in the same way as well, like we did for the stock quantities. Now, how do we check if the measure is giving us the right result? One way is that we can go to our raw Excel data file and total the numbers in the June column. I will provide the link to all the files in the description of this video. If you like, you can follow along. The number in the Excel file matches what we are seeing in Power BI, which means that the measure is working fine. So although our measure is working perfectly fine, but there is one problem with this type of calculation. In this one, we are hard coding the number six over here to indicate the month of June, which might not work, especially if let's say next month we change the opening stock from May to, and we make this report for the month of June, we will want the forecast for the first month to be forecast of July and not June. And in case if the numbers are hard coded over here, just like we have here, then the dashboard will not work. So we want to make this measure completely dynamic such that if this talk report is showing the stock for the month of August, the forecast M plus one should show us the sales forecast for the month of September and so on. So how do we achieve that? We will achieve that via the following formula. So first of all, we will define a variable 
which kind of stores the value for the latest month and the latest month in our case will be the month of the, of the date of the stock report. Stock report, inventory report date. Perfect. Now we will define the forecast. So it will be variable CST will be calculate and instead of hard coding the number six we will take the latest month which will be May in that case and add one to it lastly we will return the forecast so as you can see here that measure returning the same number that it was returning before when we had hard coded six. Now we're going to set the next two measures, which is the forecast for the second and the third month. This will be relatively simpler if you have uh, grabbed what is behind this formula that is forecast for the M plus one, M plus two and M plus three should not be a problem. We'll just change the variable over here. Instead of one, we will put two. So let's go right into it. I will copy this formula and then set up the new measure named forecast M plus two. Instead of M plus one, I'll make it M plus two. Rest everything will stay the same and we'll just put two instead of one in the forecast formula. Next, we will set up the measure for forecast M plus three. And this one, it will become M plus three. And this will become latest month plus three. Very good, the measures are now set up. We will add these measures to our matrix table by clicking on the check mark next to them. Now, as you might see, we need to do some formatting. So I'll copy the formatting from the forecast M plus one measure and paste it onto the formatting for forecast M plus two as well as M plus three. Beautiful. So things are shaping out nicely. The next column we need to add is the stock cover, which shows the stock on hand in terms of the number of months of coverage that we have. So I'll go ahead and set up the new measure. First of all, we need to take the average of the last three months forecast. So what we are going to do, we already have the last three months forecast. That is forecast and plus one plus forecast and plus two and then plus forecast and plus three and divide these three numbers by three that will give us the last three months forecast average last three months forecast then we need to calculate the stock cover so i'll name a different variable stock cover and the stock cover will be the stock quantity divided by the average of the last three month forecast Lastly, I will return stock cover. So stock cover is there on the side panel. We will add it to our matrix table. And we will format this number as a decimal point. So I'll go here, decimal. So as you can see that we have successfully implemented the formula, however, there are some rows where it's giving us an error or an infinity calculation, which is because when there is a stock of a certain product, but there is no forecast, the stock cover uh, gets calculated erroneously. So we want to put in some level of 
uh, error handling formulas which can kind of uh, deal with these type of errors as and when they arise. So what I'm going to do is that in my stock cover formula, I'll tweak the calculation a little bit. Instead of just straight away giving the stock cover formula, I'm going to give in a if statement, which kind of first checks whether the L3M forecast or whether the opening stock or the closing stock quantity is blank. If it is blank, then I want it to return blank. But if it is not blank, then I want it to return the stock cover. So the way to do it is is blank underscore L3M forecast. And if it is blank, it will return true. And I also wanted to check uh, is blank the stock quantity. And if any of these conditions are true, which means if any of these are blank, then I want the function to return blank for, uh, for the stock cover as well. However, if any of these are not blank, or if both of them actually are not blank, then I want the calculation to return the stock cover like was done before. So I'm going to hit enter and hopefully this will remove the errors that we are seeing in the current calculation. Next, we have to set up the column for the lead time. And uh, to do that, it's going to be very simple. We know that the lead time information is available in our product master data query. There is a column for lead time. So we'll just simply pick it up from there. So let's set up a new measure. I will name this measure as lead time. And the formula for this measure will be the max of the lead time column in the product master data table. Now, some of you might be wondering, why do we give the max function? Why don't we just simply refer the lead time column? Reason is that the, with DAX, you need to define some level of aggregation. So when you ask to retrieve the lead time column, Power BI needs to know how you want to bring those values in. Uh, should Power BI sum that column, average it, or what level of aggregation should it apply? So in our situation, the max function or taking the max of the lead time will work perfectly fine. Now let's add the lead time into our metrics table. And voila, it's here. Let us sort our table according to the descending order of the stock quantity so we can see some bigger values. It will make the information much more comprehensive. Next for our dashboard, we need to set up columns for reorder point and reorder quantity. However, these are slightly more complicated calculations, so let's keep them for the end. Let's first calculate the last three columns of our stock report, which is the expiry buckets. We want to break down the stock quantity into three columns. Uh, we want to see the stock that is expiring within the next three months or next six months. Then the second bucket, we want to see the stock that is expiring in 6 to 12 months. And lastly, all the remaining is stock which is expiring after 12 months. We want to keep it separate. So let's set up a measure for that. To get the expiry bucket for less than six months, effectively, we need to get the sum of stock quantity, which we can get from the value column in the stock report query. But we need this number only for those rows where the expiry date is less than 180 days from the stock report date. We also know that the current stock report date is 31st May 2024. Therefore, for this expiry bucket, we need all the stock which is expiring before 30th November 2024. To get this number, we will use the following measure. First, we are setting up a variable for the stock report date and putting it equal to the max of the inventory report date column in the stock report query. This will give us the value or the date value of 31st May 2024. Next, we are setting up another variable called max expiry date and putting it equal to the stock report date variable, which we calculated in this tab above, and adding 180 days to it. This will, this will give us a date value of 30th November 2024. 
Next, we are defining a new variable for stock value and using a calculate function here. In the first argument of the calculate function, we are instructing to get the sum of a stock value. And in the second argument, we are defining that it should sum the stock value only for the rows where expiry date is less than the max expiry date. And we know that max expiry date is 30th November 2024. So let's press enter and see how it works. So it seems like it's working perfectly fine. If you want to confirm the calculations, you can double check it from the source file, which is the stock report. And again, I have provided the link to all the files used in this video in the description of this video. I will format the numbers in thousands, similar to how we have done for the other measures. If you were able to grasp the logic behind the first expiry bucket, the other two expiry buckets should not be a big problem. I'll again copy the formula first and then walk you through in detail. Here we are starting off by defining a measure for stock report date, which will return us the 31st May 2024. Then we have two variables for the expiry date. First is the starting expiry date variable, which is stock report date plus 180 days. This will return us 30th November 2024. Second, we have a variable for ending expiry date, which is the stock report date plus 360 days. And actually, this can be 365 days as well if you want to make it more accurate. And next, in the stock variable, we are again using the calculate function. In the second argument, we are asking to take only those rows where the expiry date is greater than the starting expiry date variable which is equivalent to 30th November 2024 and the expiry date is less than the ending expiry date variable. Effectively, this means we are asking to sum the stock value only for those rows where the expiry date is between 30th November 2024 and 31st May 2025. Okay, so let's add the measure into our matrix table. I'll quickly do the formatting for this measure as well. Next, we have to calculate the third expiry bucket. Since now you would have a good understanding of how to calculate it, I'll fast forward the video a little bit so we can move to the next section. Next, we need to calculate the reorder point and the reorder quantity. Reorder point is the point at which we believe the inventory is running too low and we want to indicate this in our dashboard. Now, there can be many approaches to calculating the reorder point. In this example, I want the dashboard to trigger a reorder point when the stock cover is less than the lead time plus a safety buffer of four months. So we will use the following formula we are using an if function here. In the first argument of the if function, we are asking Power BI to check if the lead time plus four is greater than the stock cover. If yes, we want to return one, otherwise zero. Let's hit enter.
For all those products where the reorder point has been triggered, we get a value of 1. Otherwise, we see 0. Later, we will format this to make it visually more appealing. Next, we need our dashboard to tell us that wherever the reorder point has been triggered, what should be the amount of quantity that we should place an order for from our supplier. Again, there can be many approaches. You can use the EOQ model, etc. to calculate the amount to be ordered. In this example, I will assume we want to place an order which is equal to the lead time plus 4 months of forecast. Therefore, we are going to use the following formula. We are using an if function again. In the first argument, we are asking to check if the reorder flag is equal to 1. And if the reorder flag is 1, that is the first condition is true, we want to return lead time plus 4 multiplied by the average of the last 3 months forecast. If the reorder flag is not 1, then we just want to return 0. I will bring the measure into the metrics table. And instead of the product name, I will put product ID in the rows just to make the column a bit smaller so everything fits on one page. Now, as we can see, wherever the reorder flag is 1, reorder quantity has been calculated, else it is 0. But we can see one glitch here. The total row in the reorder quantity column is showing 0, which clearly is wrong. This is because Power BI is applying the same formula logic in the total line as it is using for the rest of the rows. In the total line, since the lead time plus 4 is not greater than the stock cover, reorder quantity throws the value of 0. To fix this problem, we need to tell Power BI to apply the reorder formula or reorder quantity formula whenever it sees a product ID in the first column. And when it doesn't see a product ID in the first column, it should return something else. And we can achieve this via the inscope formula. First, I will correct the formatting of the reorder quantity measure. I'll make it in thousands. And then I will set up a new measure and name it as reorder quantity 2. Then I will put the following formula in it. Here we are using an if condition. The first argument of the if condition is in scope product ID, which basically means Power BI needs to check if the product ID is in scope in the first column of the table. Second condition is the reorder quantity, which means that if the first column has a product ID, the formula should return the reorder quantity, which we just calculated in the last step. Otherwise, we just want to return 1000. And for now, I'm putting 1000 as a placeholder just to see if the calculation works. Later, we will fix this one as well. So I'll hit enter and see whether the formula works or not. Seems like the formula is working fine. Reorder quantity and reorder quantity 2 are same in all the rows except for total where the reorder quantity is giving the value of 1000. Now, of course, we do not want to hard code 1000. We want to return the sum of all the values in the total line. We can achieve this via a combination of sumx and values function. So let's go back to the reorder quantity 2 measure and instead of 1000 that we had hard coded, we will write the following syntax. Let's understand the logic behind this syntax. First part of the syntax is the values function inside which we are passing the product ID column. Values function returns a single column table with unique values. So in this case, you can imagine that the values function is returning a virtual table with one column that contains all the unique product IDs. Next to this, we are putting the reorder quantity in our syntax. This means that in the virtual table which we just generated using the values function, imagine we are adding a second column which shows the reorder quantity. And by wrapping these two things up in the sumx function, we are effectively telling Power BI to sum up the reorder quantity column which was calculated in this virtual table. So let's go ahead and hit enter to see the results. And there we go. We see the correct total calculation in the total line. As usual, I will fix the formatting of this measure. And we do not need the original reorder quantity column anymore in this view, so I'll just remove it.
Now you might have already guessed that we have a similar problem in the reorder flag formula. There are various rows for which the reorder flag is 1, but the total is showing 0. So we're going to create a new measure called reorder flag 2 and replicate the same technique to correct the total calculation for the reorder flag. There is one difference between this formula and the last one which I would want to highlight. In this formula, instead of using sumx, we will use the maxx function. Since the answer for the reorder flag is in terms of ones and zeros, we do not want to add them up, rather we will want to return one in the total line if any of the rows has one. Let's hit enter and add this measure to our matrix table. Seems like it's working perfectly fine. So now we can remove the reorder flag measure and only leave the reorder flag to measure in our matrix table. Now all our technical calculations have been set up. Next, we need to step into the shoes of our users and think from their perspective what would they want to see. So let's say if I'm the supply chain manager, I might not want to see this report by product ID. That will be too many details. I want to see the report on a subcategory or on a category level. And from this view, it's very easy. We can just simply drag the subcategory into the rows of this uh, matrix table and that will give us the uh, data by subcategory. But as you might already know, once this report has been published online, the users of this report might not have access to the data and visualization panes on the right. Therefore, we should create three buttons at the top which should enable the users to select either category, subcategory or whichever level of data they want to see. And we can achieve this effect by using the parameters. First of all, I'm going to remove the subcategory from here. So now again, our product table has product ID as the base field. And now we will set up the parameter. To set up the parameter, go to the modeling tab and set up a new parameter. In the parameter, you will define the fields that you want the user to be able to select from. Of course, this can vary from business to business, but just to convey the concept and keep things simple, I'll select category, subcategory, product name and add a slicer to this page. So next we will just trim this parameter uh, slicer down a bit. Also from the slicer settings, we'll set it up as a tile. And we have got three tiles here. We'll put the parameter at the top. Perfect. Now, at the moment, no matter what I select, it will not impact the table. And the reason is because the table does not have any link to the parameter. So in order to connect the slicer with the table, I'll need to drag the newly set parameter into the rows of the matrix table. So I'll select the table. And then drag the parameter from here and put it in the rows. So as you can see, now since the category is selected, the table is filtered or is clubbed or aggregated on a category level. When the user selects subcategory, it will show the subcategory. And when the user selects product name, it will show the product name. The product ID will always be there in the table 
And uh, when building these kind of reports where you have used the in scope formula, it's um, advisable to keep the bottommost level of the product master data in the table because all the calculations are happening on the product ID level. Also note that your users can select category and press the control key and select on subcategory. That way, after clicking on the category plus sign, the next drill down level will be of the subcategory and the third one could be the product name or whatever the users select. So it's a pretty helpful feature and usually it turns out very handy for the users. Next, we want to make sure that the text wrapping doesn't happen. So I'll just go to the table and disable the text wrap, at least from the rows. Now thinking from the user perspective, one more point of data that users, especially those from finance or from supply chain might be interested in will be to see what are those stocks which are at a high risk of getting expired and probably um, getting written off. So of course, from this report, they can see that uh, Tyvek side opening peel and, and peel and seal expending envelopes uh, we have a stock of 453 out of which 185 is expiring within the next six months however the forecast on these stocks are not too high even if we continue selling at this run rate maybe we will not be able to sell the entire 185 which means that some part of this 185 will most probably get written off and this might be the case with a lot of different stocks that are coming at the bottom uh, below but we don't want our users to spend time calculating this in their heads. We want to, uh, the dashboard to be able to give an indication itself. So we want to highlight all those uh, six months expiry buckets, all those stocks in the six months expiry bucket, which are at a high risk of getting expired and written off. So what we will do for that is set up a new measure and then conditionally format the six month expiry bucket based on that measure. So let's go ahead and do that. So we want to set up a flag for six month expiry. So 6M expiry flag, you can name it anything. Ultimately, it will not be part of our table. Uh, for this measure, we will first create a variable that stores the value of the next six months forecast. We will name this variable as forecast and we will define it as being equal to the sum of next three months forecast divided by three and multiply by six. Then we will return an if condition where we will define that if the stock expiring in less than six months is higher than the forecast variable which we just calculated above, then return one, otherwise blank. So let's add this one up into our into our dashboard and see if it's giving the right flags. I'll bring the measure slightly in the front so that we can see it very clearly. I'll bring it maybe next to the six months expiry bucket. Later on, we'll format the table uh, to ensure that all the 
<clears throat> all the fields come within the same line. So I think it's working. Wherever we see the six month expiry stock is so high that the next six months forecast will not be able to flesh it out. Uh, it's, it's highlighting it as a red. So here we can see the uh, flag for all those expiries which are at high risk. Now to make it visually more appealing rather than uh, making the users understand zeros and ones, we will, uh, what we will do is we will conditionally format the expiry bucket which is at a high risk. So the way to do it is to select the table, a tricks table, and then in the expiry six months or less than six months, we'll do the conditional formatting on the background color. And we'll go with the rules, apply to values and totals. And the field which we will base it on is the six month expiry flag. And we will say if the value is equal to one, So there we go, we have achieved the desired um, result that we wanted. Similarly for the reorder flag as well, wherever there is a reorder point triggered, we want to indicate via a flag sign rather than zeros and ones. So let's go ahead to the reorder flag too. This time we'll select icons. Again, we'll take the rules, we'll apply the flag two, we'll put it icon only, middle. We don't need all the icons, we just need one, and we'll say if the value is equal to one and number, then we want it to be formatted as this flag. So all that's working fine, but I guess one thing which we've forgotten is not included the total. So I'll just do that too. And I'll select the table. Then go to the reorder flag. Additional formatting. Icons. It's looking great now. So now that we have formatted it very well, uh, we don't need the six month expiry flag column. So I'm just gonna remove it and you'll see the conditional formatting will still work because the formula is integrated in the backend. Very good. Now, again, thinking from the user's perspective, maybe some users, uh, it's really good to see that all those stocks which are at a high risk of expiry are now being highlighted as red. However, if I'm the finance manager or supply chain manager, I might want to see only those stocks or the report only for those stocks which are at a high risk. And uh, from this one, I need to go one by one and scroll all the way down to see what are the red stocks. And of course, this is not efficient. The best thing for the user would be that they have a button at the top, which they click if they want to see only the high risk expiry stocks. So for that one, in order to set up a button similar to the parameter, we'll need to set up a slicer. And in order to set up a slicer, the values need to be coming from a table. Now, we'll need to set up a new table. Either we can set it up in our mapping table or we can set it up from here as well. So I'll go to home. First option will be yes. Second option is going to be no. And the column will be high risk expiry. 
let's load this table in. And there we go, we have our table in here. Which has only two fields, yes or no. So we're gonna use these two fields to create a slicer on the page. So I'll just copy the same slicer that we have over here because it has the formatting done the way we want it to be. And I'll remove the parameter from here and then I'll select the high risk expiry as the field here. <clears throat> okay, so right now if I select yes or if I select no, it doesn't matter because oh, we haven't built the calculation in. So now we need to set up one measure which kind of reflects what has been selected in this slicer and there are three possibilities in this slicer selection one is that the user will select yes in which case we want to highlight only those fields which are red in here which are high risk if the user selects no then we want to return only those fields which are not highlighted in red which are not at high risk and if the user has not selected anything then all the rows should appear over here so basically we will create a measure which returns one uh, for all the high risk expiries if yes is selected it returns one for all the low not so high risk expiries when no is selected and it returns one for every row if nothing is selected so i'm going to set up a new measure and name it as filter high risk and we will use the following syntax let's walk through this syntax to see what's the logic behind first of all we are defining a variable for selected value using the selected value function this variable will return yes if the user has selected yes on the slicer which we had just set up no if the user has selected no or it will return blank if nothing is selected next we are returning a switch statement the first argument of the switch statement is true. In the second argument, we need to define what needs to be evaluated. So here we are saying that if the selected value is yes and the expiry flag is equal to 1, then the function should return 1. If the selected value which the user has selected is no and the expiry flag is equal to blank, then the function should return 1. And if the user has not selected anything, that is selected value is blank, then the function should return one for all the rows. So let's hit enter and add this measure into the metrics table. So as you can see right now, since nothing is selected on the high risk filter, all the rows are returning one, which means that the user wants to see all the rows. But if I select yes, then only rows with the high risk should return one. Similarly, if I select no, then only the rows which do not have a high risk should return one. And if we go to the original situation, then in that case, all the rows should be returning one. So now we're not going to put this field into the table because of course, again, one and zeros are not very comprehensive for the users. Instead, we're going to put this measure into the filters. So we're going to remove the filter high risk from here. And put it in the report filter. And we'll put a filter to is one. And apply. Very good. Now, if we will click on yes, then the report should only show the numbers that are at a high risk. Voila, it's working. 
and if we click on no then we will only see the numbers which are at a not so high risk perfect i'll again go back to the default position and now let's set up the same thing for the reorder quantity what if the user of the report only wants to see those items which for which we need to place place a new order to the supplier let's try to filter that out but before that i'll just drag the pyramid uh, the slicers a little bit because they're better getting too small and we cannot see which slicer is which one so this is the high risk expiry slicer and then we will have one more which will have the yes and no buttons but it will be for the reorder points so again uh, now i'll move a little faster just similar to how we did for the higher ex uh, risk expiry we'll set up a new table for the reorder point To set up the filter status for the reorder flag, we will use a similar technique. Instead of using the 6 month expiry flag which we used in the last instance, we will use the reorder flag too. So let's check if this filter is working correctly. So if I select yes only the rows with the filter flag triggered should return one the rest should return zero all up <clears throat> and in case of no all the rows should return one except for those where the reorder flag has been generated very good it's working so i'm going to revert back to the original estate and remove the filter trigger point from matrix table and put it into the filter as well upon clicking yes the dashboard filters only those rows where the reorder flag has been triggered which is what we wanted to see however in some rows where there is no forecast but we have some stock the reorder point is being triggered as well. This indicates that we can improve the reorder flag formula by integrating some error handling logic. Currently, the reorder flag is using a simple if statement where if the lead time plus 4 is higher than the stock cover, then it returns 1, otherwise 0. Rather than this, we can use a switch statement as follows. Here, in the first condition, we are asking to check whether some of the next 3 month forecast is blank. And if it is blank, we want to return 0. If no, then formula should do the normal evaluation, which is whether the lead time plus 4 is higher than the stock cover, and if yes, then return 1. So let's hit enter and see if it's working properly and if it corrects the error. And there we go, yep, it's working. And also, when we click the no button, it filters only the rows where the reorder point has not been generated. We are now done with all the hard work and it's time to do the fun part which is formatting and making it look better. So let's start off by formatting our slicers. I'll select the first slicer, go to the format tab, select background and for the background I'll select the same color that we have given to our To our canvas and I'll give all the backgrounds as the same green Next, 
next we will format all the fonts in white and we reduce the size of fonts to not Now, they have, now that we have formatted one slicer, we can copy the formatting from this one and paste it on the rest of the two. Okay, now let's format the main core of our dashboard, which is the matrix table. So let's select it first. Once it has been selected, we'll go to the format tab. Go to layout and in the style, we'll first put minimal. Then we will search for row padding and make it six. Next, we will search for the global font size. Make it nine. Next, we need to center the red flag or ROP flag in the middle. So we will go to a specific column. Here we will select the reorder flag too. We will apply the setting to the total as well. Not to the header and just center it. Very good. <clears throat> Let's fix the border, which is right now blue, so we will make it green as well. Let's make the column headers bold and align towards the right. So we'll go to column headers, make it bold. Aligned to the right side. And title aligned to the left. Next, I will rename the measures to make them more comprehensive and descriptive. For example, in front of forecast M plus 1, I will mention quantities because the unit of measurement of forecast M plus 1 is quantities and so on. As you might have seen, as we were changing the names of the measures, the stock, uh, the column width was changing uh, automatically. So you want to disable that because otherwise the column widths will keep changing and sometimes the table will not fit on one page. So I will go to auto size width and turn this one off. And once this is done, then we can manually size the columns according to uh, our needs.
Next up, we're gonna publish this dashboard and see how it looks in the full screen. So there we go, we have our report here. I think it looks pretty good. Let's try to run all the buttons to see if, it's, uh, if everything is working fine. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please hit the like and subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one.